Okay, Bismillah ar rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, amma ba'd. Uh, so we finished the Battle of Khaybar, and now we're going to take uh, the next segment of the seerah, which is almost always discussed after the Battle of Khaybar, and that is the segment dedicated to the letters and the emissaries that the Prophet ﷺ sent to the various rulers. Now, what must be kept in mind is that these letters were not sent all at the same time. Rather, there are various letters that have been sent. Some scholars have documented over 25 letters that the Prophet ﷺ sent. And the problem comes, obviously, each one of these letters is not worthy of an entire, uh, you know, hour-long lecture. So what typically the early scholars of Sirah have done is to just dedicate one chapter, roughly about now, to all of these letters. And the realization is that, look, these letters occurred at different times and they were sent to different people. And what are the lessons that can be drawn from these letters? And why is it discussed right now? Because it was around this time, after Hudaybiyah, probably even a little bit before Khaybar where the letters began, but it was after Hudaybiyah and continued all the way up until the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And therefore, uh, we will also follow this methodology and talk about some of the main letters and some of the benefits that we can derive uh, from these letters. And the first of these letters, which we have already referenced, is a letter to Najashi. The letter to Najashi. And the Prophet ﷺ sent him a letter around this time. Now, this is not to be confused with Ja'far's dialogue. Ja'far's dialogue took place more than a decade ago. Ja'far's dialogue, literally a decade, or in fact more than a decade, probably 13 years have occurred. Since Ja'far has emigrated, Ja'far has actually returned now in the Battle of Khaybar, right? So perhaps the letter came when Ja'far and the, and the group had already left Abyssinia. And the Prophet ﷺ sent him a letter and uh, told him that uh, from Muhammad ibn Abdullah, to Najashi, the emperor of uh, Habasha, uh, that uh, inviting him to Islam, telling him what is the Islamic belief about Isa, that he said that I believe in Isa as the messenger of Allah, as his ruh, as the pure word that was given to Maryam. So he summarized the Islamic teachings of Isa, and then he said, Aslim to Slim, accept Islam, you will be safe. And he concluded this letter by the verse of Ali Imran, O people of the book, come to terms that are common between us. Ya ahl al-kitab ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'in baynina wa baynakum. Come to terms that are common between us, that we worship Allah alone, and that we don't take uh, uh, ourselves as gods besides Allah. And this was clearly the most successful of all of his letters. Because as we know, the Najashi accepted Islam. Now, there does appear to be some ambiguity. When did the Najashi accept Islam? And Allah knows best, but a lot of people assume that he accepted Islam when Ja'far gave him da'wah. But the fact of the matter, if he had embraced Islam back then, why would the Prophet send him a letter now, after Hudaybiyah? And therefore, what appears to be the case, that Najashi was sympathetic to Islam, but he had not actually embraced Islam. Najashi was open to Islam. And therefore, one of the very interesting things we notice in the letter to Najashi, unlike the letter to Kisra and the letter to Qaisar, the, the Caesar and the Sassanid Emperor, the Najashi letter does not have any threat at the end that if you don't accept, then all of the sin of your people will be upon you. Whereas in the letter to the Emperor of Rome, and in the letter to the Emperor of Persia, both of these emperors, they got this dire ominous warning at the end of the letter. If you do not accept, then you shall carry the burden of all of your people on the Day of Judgment. Whereas Najashi seems to have been spared this particular clause. Why? Perhaps because the Prophet knew he was just needed a little bit of a push, he's going to be accepting Islam. So Najashi, as we know, embraced Islam. And in fact, according to Al-Tabari, according to Al-Tabari, uh, Najashi actually sent his own son to respond to the letter. And he sent his son with 60 members of the uh, Habasha, and his son's name was Arha, Arha uh, ibn uh, Ashama, because his name was Ashama. Remember Najashi's name? Najashi is a title, the Negus. Najashi is a title. And his name was Ashama or Ashuma, and this is his son Arha. So according to Al-Tabari, he sent Arha with 60 delegates to give him gifts and to uh, announce his Islam and to ask or to uh, request or to say to the Prophet that if you want, I am also willing to come to Medina. If you want, I will come to Medina. But according to Al-Tabari, uh, the two boats drowned 
and all of the people died. And so this uh, delegation never came. But the Islam of Najashi obviously was known to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And two and a half years later, in the ninth year of the Hijrah, when uh, Najashi passed away, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, on the very morning that he passed away, he announced to the Sahaba, the very morning, that Najashi, Najashi is in Abyssinia, the same morning the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, your brother has died in Habasha. Your brother has died in Abyssinia and let us go pray janazah for him. So the one and only time that janazah salat ala al-ghaib was prayed without a body being present. The one and only time when uh, janazah ala al-ghaib was prayed was when Najashi passed away and that leads to the whole controversy in fiqh. When is janazah ala al-ghaib prayed? And the correct opinion appears to be when a person dies and nobody prays janazah where he died. This seems to be the strongest opinion. That janazah is prayed, salat al ghaib is prayed for those who uh, their janazah is not prayed for them. So then the Muslims in other localities will pray for them. In any case, this is the famous letter to the Najashi. The second most famous letter is the letter to Caesar, Emperor of Rome. And we already mentioned this in some detail, but there's no uh, you know, haraj in repeating all the de details because it has been more than two years since we mentioned this letter. So there's no problem in reiterating some of the details. And this letter is reported in Bukhari and Muslim. So it's a mutafaq ali, it's an authentic hadith, and it uh, mentions the uh, letter that the Prophet sent to the Caesar. Now, who was the Caesar of his time? The Caesar of his time was Heraclius. And Heraclius reigned from 610 to 641 CE. Heraclius was the emperor of Rome at this time. And Heraclius, by and large, is viewed in a very favor favorable light by both Muslim and non-Muslim historians. Heraclius has a very glorious reign, and he is credited with major victories, especially against the Persians, the Sassanids. And of course, Surat al-Rum predicted this, right? Surat al-Rum, alif lam mim, ghulibat al-Rum. And I went over the story before that the Romans had suffered a great defeat at the hands of the Persians. And Allah mentions this in the Quran. Because what had happened was the Persian emperor, uh, Khusro, uh, Khusro Aparvez, called Khusro Parvez, Khusro Aparvez had launched an attack against the Romans. And this had lasted 15, 20 years. And this attack, Khusro had managed to conquer most of Iraq. Uh, Mesopotamia, he had conquered Syria, he had even conquered Damascus and Jerusalem. I mean, this was when uh, the Persians were ruling Jerusalem, not the Romans. So the Persians had conquered Jerusalem, and the Persians had conquered, had conquered Damascus, and they even made their way into parts of Egypt. And it seemed as if the Roman Empire was on its last leg. Then what happened, Allah revealed in the Quran, Alif Lam Mim Ghulibati Rum, Fi Adan al Ardi, Wahum Mim Badi Ghalabihim, Sayaghlibun, Fi Bidri Sinin. Allah says, In a few years, the Romans will gain the upper hand. And when this verse came down, obviously the Romans were on the brink of defeat. Maybe even their civilization would have been wiped out almost. But what happened? Heraclius managed a very brave uh, uh, regrouping of his troops and he launched a counter offensive and he regained almost all of these lands up until in 628 CE. And this is when the process is alive. The verse has come down when he's alive. In 628 CE, Heraclius reaches the capital of the Sassanid Empire. And this is the famous city of, who knows? Tesiphon, Asfahan, Tesiphon. The English name is Tesiphon, and Arabic uh, is called Isfahan, right? And to this day, Isfahan, by the way, uh, it has the ruins of that massive palace, beams going, I don't know how many, 90 meters into the sky, like massive beams and palaces. So Heraclius lays siege to the very city of the Sassanid Emperor, but there are, you know, fort uh, uh, fortified walls he cannot get through, and eventually uh, Khusro, uh, the, the emperor of the Persians, he has to flee for his life from the city. And he dies a few days later. His son actually does a coup d'etat and his son Khusro's son takes over and Khusro dies a very brutal death. We'll talk a little bit about that today as well. And Khusro, we know exactly when he died. He died on the 27th of February, 628 CE. And this is, we'll talk about this in the seventh year of the Hijrah. And this is when the process is alive. All of this is happening, right? Heraclius gains the upper hand. Khusro is killed. He is uh, deposed by his own son in a coup d'etat. And this occurs when the process is alive. Now, back to the story, Heraclius. Heraclius was a, uh, a great warrior. 
He was a political leader, and he was also very learned in Christian theology. Unlike most emperors of the time, Heraclius actually was a scholar of Christianity. And Islamic sources mention this, right? Christian sources mention a number of incidents that clearly indicate that this guy knew what was, this was all about. He understood theology. And perhaps his most famous uh, issue of theology is that he tried to bring forth a... Uh, a type of compromise between the two major factions of Christianity of his time. He wanted to bring about unity amongst the Christians. And the two major factions of his time were uh, the Monophysites and the Diophysites. Now, this is before, you know, this is before uh, Catholicism and Protestant Christianity is literally yesterday. We're talking about 1,500 years ago here, right? In those days, the two major branches of Christianity were the Monophysites and the Diophysites. And uh, to this day, the, the Akbat and the Nestorians are one version, and then Catholics and Protestants are the Copts and the Nestorians of Iraq. They still uh, are uh, the Monophysites, sorry, they're the Diophysites, excuse me. And then main Mainstream Christianity, which is uh, Catholicism and Protestant and Orthodox Christianity, uh, is the other side. So Caesar or Heraclius attempted to combine these two theologies, and believe it or not, he actually brought forth a new theology that was kind of halfway between the two, right? So he wanted to bring about a compromise that would allow both factions of Christians to unite. However, no matter he might have been a great politician, he clearly was not a skilled theologian because anybody who knows anything about theology knows there is no compromise when it comes to theology. There's absolutely no compromise. It's my way or the highway. And so his new theology was neither accepted by the Monophysites nor by the Diophysites, and so it kind of withered away. And that theology, which also has a name, is it Monolithic? I forgot this fancy name for it. But the, uh, and the whole issue, by the way, is over Jesus Christ. What is he? And you, you know by now, I've said this so many times, the primary controversy of early Christianity for the first four, five hundred years is over who is Jesus Christ? What is he? Is he God? If he's God, then how is he related to God himself? Is he co-eternal? Is it the same substance? different substances, the same will, two wills, and all of this was the, the, the discussion uh, for, for all of these hundreds of years. So Heraclius tried to bring forth a new theology, and it lasted for a while, but neither group would compromise, so it kind of dwindled away. But the very fact that he's doing this shows what? That he understands theology. He is sympathetic. He knows what the controversies are. Now, as for the letter of the Prophet to Heraclius, it is mentioned in a lot of detail in Sahih al-Bukhari that the Prophet sent Dihya al-Kalbi uh, al to the governor of Basra. Pause here. Where is Basra? What is Basra? Who can tell me? No, I told you this so clearly three months ago. South of Damascus. This is not Basra. This is Basra. Right? There was no city Basra when the process of Mizr. Basra was made by the uh, Muslim armies after they conquered Iraq. Right? Any reference of uh, Basra, which is how it's pronounced, in the Sira literature is to a small town south of Damascus. Okay? And it still stands to this day. So, the process of and, and Basra was an Arab town with Roman culture. Right? So, it's Arab, but it's the very fringe of the Arab peninsula. And so they are Christian, and the culture, the language, the, you know, the, the currency is all Roman. So whenever the trading expeditions would go north, they would trade at Basra. Right? Because that was where they would go. Rihlat al shitai was saif this is Basra. So they would go to Basra, and then they would trade, and then they would come back down to Mecca. So the Prophet sent a letter to the ruler or the governor of Basra, so that he will send it to the Caesar. And it so happened that... Heraclius was visiting Jerusalem at the time. Did the Prophet ﷺ know this or it was a coincidence? We don't know. But most likely it was a coincidence. So the Prophet ﷺ sent a letter to the emperor uh, through Basra. And Basra, because it's just very short from Jerusalem, it arrived very quickly in Caesar's hands. And Caesar was in Jerusalem. And here we begin the narration from Abu Sufyan, uh, that Abu Sufyan uh, narrates this in Sahih Bukhari, and I mentioned this detail in detail, I think, right? I did mention this narration, right? A long time ago, uh, the conversation between Abu Sufyan and Heraclius. I'll quickly repeat that, very quickly, because we went over it in detail. That Abu Sufyan narrates that he was trading in Syria, pause, in Basra. He was trading in Syria, in Basra. When a crier comes out and says, you know, you are being called to Jerusalem. So they march to Jerusalem, and he doesn't understand what's going on. Lo and behold, Abu Sufyan is called to the presence of the emperor himself.
right? And this is an amazing story. Abu Sufyan from Quraysh is now standing in the palace of Caesar in front of the emperor himself. What a auspicious occasion, right? And uh, Caesar calls him and all of the Roman dignitaries are there. He calls his Arab translator and then he translates these questions to Abu Sufyan. That the whole group is there. Most likely there were some other tribes as well, non qurashi Arab tribes, because this is how the groups went. And so uh, Abu Sufyan asks, sorry, Heraclius asks all of these Arabs, who is the closest in relation to you to the man that claims to be a prophet? The only Qurashi is Abu Sufyan. So, and Abu Sufyan is like a, a third cousin twice removed, your third cousin once removed, I think. So Abu Sufyan says, I am the closest relation, right? Abu Sufyan is Banu Umayyah and the process is Banu Hashim. They go back literally three generations and it's the same person. So Abu Sufyan says, I am. So Heraclius says, sit in front of me. Now this is amazing. It shows us Heraclius's wisdom. Heraclius knows that all of these people are enemies. He knows these people don't like the Prophet. He knows they're still pagans. How do you extract information from an enemy and prove it to be correct? Look at Heraclius' tactic. And this clearly shows this was a wise and an intelligent ruler. Heraclius used them against themselves. And he divided the group into Abu Sufyan who's sitting in the front and the rest of his colleagues sitting in the back. So Abu Sufyan cannot see the rest, his back is to them. And he says to Abu Sufyan, I will ask you a series of questions. And he says to the group behind Abu Sufyan, if Abu Sufyan lies, motion to me that he's lying. Now obviously if one of them motion, he'd get a prize, he'd get some money, he'd get honor, right? So Abu Sufyan was forced to tell the truth. Because he knows if he lies, somebody's going to snitch on him, right? Somebody's going to rat him out. Somebody's going to say that he's lying and then uh, Abu Sufyan will be exposed. So he said, Wallahi, had it not been that I was afraid that my companions would accuse me of lying, I would have not spoken the truth because at this time he's not a Muslim. Abu Sufyan will accept Islam. When does he accept Islam? Conquest of Mecca. So this shows this incident takes place around 7 AH, right? This incident takes place in the seventh year of the Hijrah. So he asks Abu Sufyan, what is the status of this man amongst you? How is his family? Abu Sufyan says he belongs to a very noble and good family. He asks, has anyone in your society ever claimed to be a prophet before him? Abu Sufyan says, no, he's the first man. We didn't understand what is prophet until he began preaching that he's a prophet. Were any of his ancestors kings? No. Do the noble and rich follow or the poor and the downtrodden? The poor and the downtrodden. Are they increasing day by day or decreasing? They are increasing. These converts, when they convert, do they eventually give up and leave the faith or do they, do they remain in the faith? They remain in the faith. No murtad. They remain in the faith. Have you ever accused him of lying? No, we've known him to be an honest man. Does he break his promises? No, he has not broken any promise. But right now we just have a treaty with him. Which treaty? Hudaybiyah. And we don't know what he might do. Abu Sufyan says, this is the only thing that I could squeeze in. Right? We don't know he might break it. That's the only thing he could squeeze in. We don't know what he might do. Have you ever had a war with him? Yes. What was the outcome of that battle? Sometimes he won, sometimes we won. Badr, Uhud, Ahzab. Right? Sometimes he won, sometimes we won. What does he command you to do? He commands us to worship Allah and Allah alone. And to not worship anything that our forefathers used to worship. And he ordered us to pray, to speak the truth, to be chaste, and to have good re relations with our relatives. So Heraclius then explained every one of his questions. He said, I asked you about his family. And you replied that he belongs to a very noble family. And in fact, all of the prophets of God come from noble families in their people's. I asked you about anybody else if he had claimed to be a prophet before. You said no. If the answer had been yes, I would have thought this is just a fashion, a fad that people have invented. Now he is the other person. It's cool to be a prophet, right? But you're saying nobody before him said that he's a prophet in your society. I asked you if his ancestors were kings. You said no. If his ancestors had been kings, I would have thought this is a technique or a tactic to get his kingdom back. Politics runs in blood. 
once you or your family have been in politics, look at the Bush dynasty, look at the other dynasties here, the Kennedy dynasty. Once it's in your blood, it's in your blood, right? So Heraclea says, if there had been politics in his blood, I would have thought this is just a technique to get people behind him and to regain his kingdom. But you said he doesn't have kings in his ancestry. I asked you whether he's ever accused of telling lies before about money and, and gold and silver. And you said no. So I wonder, a person who has never lied about gold and silver, about money, how could he lie about God? Now this is amazing here. Heraclius, the kafir, is giving Abu Sufyan the mushrik da'wah. Saying, you're saying he's an honest man, he's never lied or cheated or betrayed a trust. He hasn't lied to you about gold and silver. Now you expect he will bring forth the biggest lie. And that is the lie about God himself. Doesn't make any sense. Heraclius said, I asked you who follows him, the rich or the poor? And you said the poor. And this is in fact all of the prophets of God. The poor accept their message before the rich. Right? Now just pause here. Anything that attracts rich people, right? Any type of methodology or 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 other ologies, without mentioning names here, that attracts the elite and the rich, something is wrong. The truth is always accepted by those who have nothing. And the rich and powerful have the most to lose by the truth. And that's why even in this land, which group has the largest converts? It's not the rich and powerful, right? It is those that are socioeconomically of a lesser level. They're the ones who have converted more. And that's the reality. Uh, Heraclius says, I asked you whether his followers are increasing or decreasing. And you said they are increasing. And this too is the sign of the truth. That the truth always gains more followers. I asked you if anybody left his religion. And you said, never. And in fact, once faith enters the heart, it can never leave the heart after that. In other words, it's a sign of Iman, right? It's a sign of a real, true religion that when Iman enters the heart, it will never leave after that. I asked you whether he has ever betrayed you and you said no, and the prophets of God can never betray or break a promise. I asked you what he ordered you to do. He said that he ordered you to worship Allah and Allah alone, etc., etc. And these are all the marks of a prophet. Then Heraclius said, if what you have said is true, then he will very soon occupy this very space under my feet. And we knew from our scriptures that God would be sending somebody, but we didn't expect it to be from your race. You see, they didn't expect the Arabs to bring forth the religion of Ibrahim again. They were expecting it from the Yahud. They were not expecting the promised one, or they were not expecting the one that is predicted to come from the Arabs. And, uh, and then he says, if I could reach him, definitely I would go to him and I would wash his feet, etc., etc. Uh, and then Heraclius called for the letter to be read, after understanding the context, right? So notice here again, the wisdom and the foresight. He wasn't hasty to open the letter. He's getting a letter from somebody who claims to be a prophet. Let me find out who is this man. So he sends for Abu Sufyan. Let me find out the context. Now he opens the letter. And of course the letter is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim from Muhammad uh, Abdullahi wa Rasulihi ila Hiraq al-Azim ar-Rum to Heraclius the Emperor of Rome. Aslim to Slim. Accept Islam, you will be safe. Uh, uh, aslim, yutik Allahu ajraka marratain. Accept Islam, Allah will give you a double reward. And if you reject Islam, then you will be committing a sin and the sin of the Arisiyin will be upon you. Now, Arisiyin is a word that has caused problems for our classical scholars because it's not an Arabic word. And most scholars have interpreted Arisiyin to mean the peasants, meaning the folk, the common folk. If you, O Emperor, refuse the truth, then you shall bear the blame of the common folk. Now we'll get back to this word later on, but remember it is Arisiyin. And then he recited the same verse of Ali Imran, come to a common term between us. The same verse, Ali Imran verse 64. When Heraclius finished the letter, this is Abu Sufyan saying, there was a great hue and cry in the royal court, and we were told to leave his gathering. I mentioned to my companions as we exited that the matter of Ibn Abi Kabsha. Ibn Abi Kabsha was a derogatory term for the Prophet He said, Abu Sufyan is not a Muslim now. And Ibn Abi Kabsha is a very derogatory ter uh, term. 
and it's something that is said out of jest or out of you know a bad nickname. The matter of Ibn Abi Kabsha has become so big that the ruler of the Bani Al Asfar, the Romans, is now scared of him. The matter of the Prophet is now so big that the ruler of emperor is now uh, scared of him. Then Abu Sufyan says, that was when for the first time in my heart I realized that this matter, Islam, would eventually prevail and this was the first time Islam entered my heart. After 20 years of opposing, now in the palace of the Caesar, Abu Sufyan says, I realize this is beyond my control now, right? And Abu Sufyan, therefore, and he reluctantly, he converted. He did convert reluctantly towards the very end. And there's no question that, as we say this, we don't mean to disrespect. But, as Allah says, those who convert at the end, after the conquest, are not like those who convert before. And Abu Sufyan is of those who converted at the very end. And even then, there was some reluctance and it took a while for Iman to come into his heart. Uh, and we will talk about that when we talk about that. Now, we also learn that the Prophet ﷺ, sent a letter to the Caesar when he was camped in the battle of Tabuk. So most likely then, this is a separate letter. Some have said it is the same letter, but most likely this is a separate letter. And it could be the same because we really are not sure uh, of this. And in the Musnad Imam Ahmad, we learn of a very interesting footnote to this incident that is not mentioned in Bukhari. It's not mentioned in Bukhari. And that is that Abu Heraclius responded back by sending an emissary to the Prophet he found an Arab from the tribe of Tanukh. We don't know his name, but he is called the one from Tanukh, at tanukhi And this is called in Sira literature, the Hadith of the Tanukhi, Hadith of Tanukhi. We don't know his name, just a man from Tanukh. And he found an Arab that he trusted and the Tanukh were Christian Arabs. And so he handed a letter to him and he said to this Tanukhi that I am actually sending you as a spy basically. The letter is just a, a ruse. I'm sending you as, a, as, a, as a, an ayn. Look out. It's a spy. And I want you to monitor three things. Number one, does he mention the letters that he sends to me and to the other kings? Does he mention the letters? Is that something that comes up in his conversation? Number two, does he mention the night when my letter will be read to him? See what is his response. There's a question in there. Does his response mention the night? The night, day and night, the night. And number three, see if he has something strange on his back. Khatam and Nabuwa. So the Tanukhi came and the Prophet ﷺ asked him, who are you? He said, I am a man from Tanukh and the Caesar has sent me. And the Prophet ﷺ said that you should embrace the religion of your forefather Abraham, Ibrahim. You should become a Muslim. And the man said, let me think about it. I'll think about it, you know. And here is the, uh, a letter from Caesar. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ did not even open the letter. And he just had a conversation with the Tanukhi. And he said in that conversation, the Tanukhi is reporting. So the whole conversation, we don't know, but... Tanukhi remembers certain things. He said, the Prophet ﷺ, I sent my letter, my, my letter to Kisra, the emperor of Persia, but he tore it up. We'll talk about this in section 3. Right now we're talking about the letter to Caesar. The next section is the letter to Kisra. I sent my letter to Kisra, but he tore it up, so Allah will tear his kingdom up. And I sent my letter to the Caesar, and he protected it, hafidhaha. So Allah will protect his kingdom. So the Tanukhi said, check one. First check, right? That by sending the letter to the Caesar and protecting it, so his kingdom will be protected. Then he opened up the letter and in it, the Caesar asked him a question. And that question was, your messenger told us that your book describes, the Quran describes a heaven that is as broad as... Sorry, a Jannah, not a heaven. A Jannah that is as broad as the skies and the earth. Jannah and Arduha, because Samawati, Arduha, Samawati, and Ard. Right. So the question is, if Jannah is as big as the skies and the earth, where, according to your religion, is Jahannam? This is the question. And the Prophet ﷺ responded, Subhanallah, 
فأين الليل إذا أقبل النهار سبحان الله You're asking Allah to outwit him Where do you think the night goes when the day comes? So he responded to the question with another question and the question had the term Layl in it فَأَيْنَ اللَّيْلُ إِذَا أَقْبَلَ النَّهَارُ So the Tanukhi said check two Number, number two check as well, right? Then he stayed a day or two waiting to see if he could, you know, look at the back of the process. But obviously, how is he going to see the back of the process? And because he's wearing a shirt. So finally, the Tanukhi says, okay, I'll go back and tell him I saw two of the three signs, right? So he went to the process and he said that, and he's not a Muslim at this stage. And he said that, uh, oh, Muhammad, وسلم, I will now go back to the Caesar and uh, uh, I'm leaving uh, to, to return to him. So the Prophet وسلم, said, wait. He turned around, lowered his shirt and said, go and tell your Caesar what you have seen. So he showed him the third sign, which is the uh, Khatim al nubuwa And so the man returned with all three checks. So clearly from our tradition, now obviously, I don't need to tell you from the Western tradition, these details are not mentioned. This is from our tradition, right? From the Western tradition, it's actually pretty amazing that the reigns of the Caesar and Heraclius and all of these incidents match up perfectly, right? But the Western tradition does not mention any of these letters, much less the details of theology or whatnot. Obviously, this is from our tradition. Uh, and uh, the Western tradition does not have anything of this nature. But from our tradition, we learn that the uh, Caesar then realized that this is true. And Bukhari then returns to the narration of Caesar. Now this story of the Tanukhi is not mentioned in Bukhari. And you need to understand it to understand the next bit. So Bukhari actually has two stories. And you would think it's the same story. It's not the same story. These are two separate stories. The first of them is Abu Sufyan and Heraclius. The second of them is Heraclius pretending to embrace Islam. They, these stories don't happen the same day. They actually happen maybe a year or two apart. So the second story takes place after the Tanukhi incident. Is that clear? Right? We add the Tanukhi incident in the middle. Then we get to the, 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 the story that is mentioned in Bukhari. And the story uh, goes as follows. That, uh, that Heraclius was the head of the Christians of, of Rome. And uh, one of the narrators uh, uh, mentions that when Heraclius one day woke up, uh, he woke up in an angry or in a sad mood. And some of his priests asked him, uh, why are you in such a sad mood? Heraclius said that I have seen a dream and my astrologers have foretold a very evil omen, a very evil sign. And that is that a leader has appeared of a new people. This leader will challenge me. A leader has appeared of a new people and these people circumcise themselves. These people circumcise themselves. So his viziers, his ministers, his uh, uh, senators said, what is there to worry about? The only group that practices circumcision are the Yehud. And go and send another you know, problem, another irritation, go and send another you know, command and decree. And of course, anti-Semitism has always existed in ancient Christianity. And I've said this many times as well. We as Muslims did not know the meaning of anti-Semitism up until recently. Right? Historically speaking, anti-Semitism has been a uniquely Christian phenomenon. And it is impossible for the Arabs who are Semites to be anti-Semitic because that will mean they're against their own peoples. Nonetheless, uh, the point being that this issue of uh, irritating the, the Jews or putting more restrictions on them has always been a theme of medieval Christianity. So his viziers, his ministers said to him, not viziers, viziers is a Muslim term. His ministers, his senators said to him, why don't you just send another rule upon the Yehud, make them, clamp them down upon them, do this and that. And before the rule could come, before Caesar could enact such a rule, Dihya al-Kalbi arrived in his court. Dihya al-Kalbi arrived in his court with the message of the Prophet Wasallam, And the Heraclius said, go check is Dihya circumcised or not. Now, the Arabs, by and large, did not circumcise themselves. This was something that began in Islam. By and large, the Arabs did not circumcise themselves, right? Some of them did, some of them didn't. It wasn't a, uh, a custom that was amongst all the Arabs. And so, Dihya al-Kalbi was examined by the guards of Caesar. Lo and behold, he circumcised. And that's what made Heraclius really concerned that something's going on here. And Heraclius then wrote to a letter to the, a friend of his in Rome, uh, and uh, who was 
even more knowledgeable uh, than Heraclius. Most likely this is John IV who was later to become the Pope. This is my theory, but Allah knows best. John IV uh, later becomes the Pope of the Catholic, uh, of the, well, it's not quite Catholic at this stage, but the Christians. And so Heraclius writes a letter to somebody, we don't know his name in the Sira, to somebody in Rome who is more knowledgeable than him. And Bukhari does not mention, but it is my theory that it is this man who writes the three signs to Heraclius. This is my theory, take it or leave it. That these three signs, this man writes to Heraclius. That go test the prophet with these three signs. Then Heraclius sends the Tanukhi with these three signs. The Tanukhi comes back and it's all check. So then he realizes this is the one. Now Bukhari continues. That when he got the Tanukhi back, basically Bukhari continues that he called all of the senators into the room, closed the door, and then he announced to them, what do you think if I were to say that this messenger that has come, I embrace his faith? Now obviously by this time, the Roman Empire is the bastion of Christianity and they start bolting and they start saying, there's no way you're going to be our emperor if you leave you know, the faith of Jesus, etc., etc. So they find the doors closed and Heraclius says, I was just testing your faith. I will always be true to Christianity. Now, obviously, this whole story is only found in Muslim sources. It's not found in the uh, Christian sources. And so, uh, Heraclius basically does not accept Islam, and he dies upon uh, his faith. Now, actually, he dies somewhat of a miserable death. There was a coup in his own palace eventually. This is after the ending of Islam. Heraclius was alive when the Muslims conquered Jerusalem. The prediction that he said, he saw it happen. He said, they will rule this land under my feet. And less than seven years, and this is amazing, and we've said this many times before, that these massive empires, right, were literally, you know, conquered by literally a bunch of Bedouins from the desert. Coming out of the desert without the arms, the weapons, without the military techniques. He is speaking from Jerusalem, surrounded by, you know, uh, uh, the, the Roman Empire goes for another 300 miles. And he says, if what you're saying is true, eventually he will control this land. It wasn't eventually, it was seven years from when he said that. He's still alive. He sees the carving up of the Roman Empire. Damascus, Syria, Jerusalem, for it is now Palestine. All of this goes to the Muslims. And then Alexandria within a few years, as we talked about, right? All of this goes. And then, of course, the Sassanids are a whole different story. And we're going to talk about them right now. So this is Caesar. How about uh, the Emperor of Rome? Now, the Emperor of Rome, sorry, the Emperor of, uh, of Persia. The Emperor of Persia, uh, his name was Khusro. His name was Khusro. And he had a title of uh, Aparwiz. Aparwiz. And this Aparwiz is commonly referred to in our cultures, especially in the Pakistani and Indian cultures, as Parvez. But his actual name was Aparwiz. Uh, Aparwiz, maybe. Aparwiz. But it is now made into Parvez in our culture. Anybody who's called Parvez, this is where it comes from. Any Parvezes in the audience? No Parvezes over here, huh? Huh? Parvez Musharraf? <laughs> Parvez Musharraf. Okay. So the president of Pakistan is named after the Sassanid ruler. He's no longer the president? No. So many coups happening, I don't know, I don't keep track of Pakistani politics. Anyway, so, uh, and uh, this Aparviz, this Khusro, reigned from 590 to 628. And, uh, 628, and he was the last of the great Sassanid kings. The last. After him, the Sassanid empire never regained its glory. The very last emperor of the Sassanid Empire, the great emperor. There were some you know, minor skirmishes and a few people after him. And then within nine years, the Sassanid Empire literally imploded, right? After in his own lifetime, having conquered almost half of the Roman Empire. Imagine, Khusro Aparviz was the, was the emperor who conquered Damascus, who conquered Jerusalem, whose forces entered Egypt. Can you imagine this man's might? And he saw the empire crumble before his very eyes. And within less than a decade, the Sassanid Empire was wiped off the face of this earth as if it never existed. And why did this happen? Well, from our stories, is very simple. Obviously, modern historians have their theories here and there. Uh, even though really, no matter what, whether you're a believer or not, there's no question it is an amazing, amazing, amazing event of human history that this mighty civilization and empire that was threatening the very existence of Rome 10 years ago, 
right? Literally disappears. It disappears within a few years and it completely implodes and crumbles and it be embraces Islam so much so that Zoroastrianism is no longer practiced in the lands of Zoroaster. And the mighty fires that were lit and all of this, all now, khalas, you know, it is now gone. That mighty empire, it embraced Islam and uh, it became under the, role, uh, under the rule of the uh, Muslims. Now, uh, Khusro Aparviz, as we said, uh, ruled from 590 to 628 and historians by and large Muslim and non-Muslim have painted him as a very cruel emperor as a very lustful sensual emperor uh, 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 books of history mention that he had a, a, a harem a harim of course it's not, it wasn't called a harem harem is an Arabic word uh, that he had a harem of 3,000 concubines and he was uh, per a person given to sensual pleasures and people hated him for his cruelty this is uh, Khusro. And the Prophet sent him a letter through the ruler of Bahrain. Because Bahrain, now, Bahrain at the time of the Prophet wasn't just the island, it was actually more than the uh, island. And uh, he sent Abdullah ibn Hudhafa uh, to the ruler of Bahrain to pass on the letter to Aparviz. And Al Tabari mentions the text of the letter. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim from Muhammad the Messenger of Allah to Khusro the Emperor of the Persians. Peace be on those who follow the guidance. And these are, who are the people who follow the guidance? Those who believe in God and His messengers and testify that there is no God other than Him and that He is unique having no partners and that Muhammad is His slave and messenger. And I call you with the da'wah of Allah, with the call of Allah, for I am the Messenger of Allah to all of mankind to warn those who are alive and to establish the evidence against those who reject. So therefore, aslim to slim, the same phrase. Accept Islam, you will be safe. But if you refuse, then you shall have the sins of all of the Majus on you. Right? As the leader, you have a double responsibility. Now the emperor uh, was a very arrogant person. And when the letter came to him, he scoffed at this letter. And he mocked the messenger, uh, the messenger of the Prophet ﷺ, And he tore up the letter in front of his face. And when the news reached back the Prophet ﷺ, this hadith is in Bukhari. The Prophet ﷺ said that he tore up my letter. Allah will tear his kingdom up every tearing. And that's an emphasis. That as he tore my letter up, so Allah will disintegrate his kingdom because of the disrespect that has been uh, shown. And the emperor sent uh, a message through one of his other governors uh, by the name of Badan. And Badan was also a governor, but not from Bahrain. Uh, Badan was a governor more towards the uh, what would now be the, not the Qatari side, but more on the Yemeni side, like more on the southern coast, right? So, and Badan was more trusted to him than the emperor, than the, than the governor of Bahrain. So he sent a, a letter to Badan, and he said to Badan, go send me some spies, sorry, send some spies to Medina, and find out more information about this man. And if you're able to physically bring him back to me, bring him back. I mean, what arrogance. Two people are going to go and bring back the process from, uh, when the Quraysh have failed. But you see his arrogance. But definitely bring me back news about this man. So, Badan chose two of his trusted uh, emissaries. And their names were Babaweh and Khur Khasra. Babaweh and Khur Khasra. And they uh, went to Medina with a letter. And the letter was just a ruse. It's not anything important. The point is to get some information about the Prophet ﷺ, about Islam. And uh, when they arrived in Medina, they were terrified because they knew they were spies. And, they, you know, and if they were caught, they were going to be in trouble. They were terrified. And the Prophet ﷺ said, wait and come back to me the next day. I don't want to get the letter right now. Come back to me the next day. The next day, the two emissaries came and they brought the letter again and the Prophet ﷺ didn't even open it. And he said, go back to your Rabb. Your Rabb meaning Badan. Because they called, the, we in Islam are not allowed to call Rabb, يعني, our, you know, but they call their, their, their emperors Lord. They call their rulers Lord. So go back to your Rabb and tell him that my Rabb has killed his Rabb. His Rabb being Khusro. His Rabb being Khusro. You go back to, you know, this is definitely a play on words. You go back to your Rabb, their Rabb is Badan, right? And go tell Badan, your Rabb, that my Rabb has killed his Rabb, meaning Khusro. 
and that uh, uh, his son has taken over. Now, the, the two were completely in shock. And they went back to Badan without even talking about the letter or anything. They went back to Badan, and by the time they got back, they discovered the news as well that, in fact, Khusro Aparwiz, Khusro Parviz, had fled from Tesifan, from Asfahan, and his son, yes, the Jard, his son had performed a coup d'etat, had executed a coup d'etat, and his son had sent an army to actually uh, imprison his father. Now, this is very common in the old times. People would kill their own fathers and brothers for the sake of power. To, to imprison his own father. In the meantime, Yazdajar offers a peace treaty with the Romans. So the Romans go back. They don't actually conquer Tesaphon. So Heraclius goes back. And Yazdajar murders his own father. He kills his own father in a very cruel way. He starves him to death for five days. And then in dungeons. It's a very cruel death. And it's just the, the way they used to do things back then, I guess. And uh, Western sources mention that this incident happened around 28th February uh, 628 CE. The killing of Khusro happened in 628 CE. And this corresponds exactly with when this might have been happening possibly in the Seerah, and that is Jumad al Ula of 7 AH. Jumad al Ula of 7 AH. And for those who deny the Seerah or deny a hadith, these types of things, I mean, you cannot fabricate this type of stuff. The precision to get it down to a right date. You know, you know the Munkiri Hadith people, right? You know the people, you cannot possibly fabricate these things. Because it's very, it's impossible to bring it down. That while the emissaries are there, and the Prophet says, my Lord has killed his Lord today. Go back and, and, and find out. And that's exactly what happened. That in Jumad al-Ula of 7 AH, Khusro met his death. And exactly as the Prophet uh, predicted, that within a few years, Allah literally disintegrated the kingdom of the Sassanids as if it never existed. And such an implosion has rarely been seen in the history of mankind, where a nation collapses for no clear reason. Now, obviously, if you can't find, if you don't know a reason, you'll have to find some. And modern historians, they, f they say there was this, there was that. But in the end of the day, I mean, these intrigues happen all the time. They're not the end of kingdoms. Military victories, and they, for 350 years, the Romans and Persians were at each other's throats. Neither of the two disappeared, right? Anyway, the Muslims came, and within eight years, Tesiphon became Isfahan, which it is to this day. And the entire uh, province, the entire lands of Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and Khorasan, which is what the uh, assassin is controlled, all of them came under Muslim lands. And this is uh, predicted by the Prophet ﷺ. Now, what happened to Badan? What happened to the two emissaries? When the two emissaries returned, we learned from one of the small treatises uh, written by Abu Ubaid al-Qasim bin Salam, one of the early authors, 234 CE, uh, sorry, 234 AH, he dies. He writes a book about uh, uh, taxes and jizya and whatnot. And he has a paragraph there, which actually is a part of the seerah. And he mentions that when these two people came back and told them what the Prophet had told him, so Badan realized that this man is a true prophet. Badan embraced Islam. These two emissaries embraced Islam. And large groups from uh, the er that area of Yemen, which would be the eastern tip of Yemen, the eastern, uh, the, what is in, in the Oman area? What is the Oman area? They embraced Islam. And uh, the Prophet wasallam then sent them another letter after they had embraced Islam. And uh, he told them about the rules of jizya. And he said that, if anybody accepts Islam and prays and fasts and whatnot, they are a part of the believers. If not, and they remain majus, so they were majus in that area, then let them pay the jizya and that is fine. So this is the story of uh, Kisra and Badan. There were other letters written as well, and we'll just quickly go over two of them and then conclude. Uh, and of the most famous of the next batch of letters is the letter to Muqawqis. And Muqawqis is, Muqawqis is the title given to the governor or the ruler of Egypt. Muqawqis is a title, just like Kisra is a title, and Najashi is a title, Muqawqis is a title. And Muqawqis is a title given to the ruler of Egypt, and his name was Juraj ibn Mina. And uh, the Prophet wrote him a letter, and we don't have in any authentic narration the actual text of the letter. We don't have that. But we do know 
that uh, Muqawqis was polite and he sent back uh, gifts and he sent back uh, cloth and he sent back uh, Dullul which was to become the mule of the Prophet and he sent back uh, Maria and uh, her sister uh, Shirin or Sirin and, uh, and Maria of course is Umm Ibrahim and so he gifted these things to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, is said to have remarked that uh, the Khabith, referring to Muqawqis, the Khabith has protected his kingdom by his politeness basically but Allah will not allow his kingdom to last. The Khabith has protected his kingdom for the time being but Allah will not allow his kingdom to last. And the Prophet also sent letters to uh, the governors of uh, other areas which are now in Oman. Uh, and uh, he sent uh, Amr ibn al-As, the famous Amr ibn al-As. He sent him to what is now Oman. And uh, the leaders of Oman also embraced Islam. He sent letters after the conquest of Mecca. So Oman embraced Islam. And then after 200 years... Uh, Oman became an Ibadite country and that's a separate story that the Ibadis came and took over Oman after 200 years until that date has been Ibadi and he also sent letters to uh, other tribes as well and scholars have listed over 20 such letters to various provinces within Arabia the more important ones we have discussed and then the rest we don't have to discuss each and every one one of them being to Musaylam al kadhab one of them being to the Banu Hanifa. And they said, the Banu Hanifa said, we will accept Islam only if you share power with us. And if you give power to us, then we'll embrace Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ responded back to him that, in al-arda lillahi yurituha man yashaw min ibadihi. The earth belongs to Allah, and Allah will give it to whomever he pleases. And as you know what happened with Musaylama after this. Now, some of the benefits we can derive, uh, and then inshallah we'll call it an evening, some of the benefits we can derive from these uh, letters. Uh, first and foremost, long-term goals. Long-term goals. Although most of these letters did not have any immediate major impact, except for Najashi, really. That was the only one that really had a significant impact. And even that, by the way, it was significant in that Najashi embraced Islam, but his people did not embrace Islam at the time. Only Najashi did. And that's why there was no janaza over him when he died. Right? So there was no major political impact from these letters. But the fact of the matter is that there clearly is the intention to make the message of Islam a global message. And that's really the key point here. That it is amazing that within one decade of the Prophet and writing these letters, every single land that he, that he wrote a letter to was within the lands of Islam. There's no land that he wrote a letter to, except that in less than a decade, that land was incorporated into the land of Islam. And this is an amazing reality that the Prophet is indeed aiming global. And so what's happening here is that the Prophet ﷺ is making the Islamic Republic or the Islamic Empire an inter international nation. A nation or an empire or a republic that is now worthy of dialogue, worthy of exchanging ambassadors with Kisra, with, with Caesar, with Najashi. This is now becoming uh, a civilization like all other civilizations. Also, just as we notice whom he did send letters to, let us also notice whom he did not send letters to. No doubt everybody knew that there were civilizations beyond the Romans and the Persians and beyond the Habasha. These were the three major areas he targeted. Everybody knows beyond the Habasha, there's a whole continent of Africa. Everybody knows beyond the Persians, there are the, the Chinese, the Sin and whatnot. But the Prophet did not send them any letters. Why? Well, because there's no direct contact with them. There's a pragmatic approach here that concentrate on those that have dialogue with the uh, Muslims and the Arabs. Now, another interesting point here is that clearly the response of the rulers has some type of theological weight for us. Look at what the Prophet ﷺ said to Kisra. He tore my letter up, Allah will tear his letter up. Look at what he said to Muqawqis. Because he was polite to me, Allah will keep his kingdom. Look at what he said to the Caesar. Because he preserved my letter, Allah will preserve his kingdom. And look at what uh, Caesar said to Tanukhi. Does he mention the letters of the kings that he writes to? So clearly there's something theological that we have in our tradition about this regard. Another interesting thing, look at the letters themselves. Each letter is just one paragraph, very short, very succinct, very to the point. It's not drawn out intensive theology. Each letter begins with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
So this is a sunnah that we should follow in official letters that we write. Each letter begins from so-and-so to so-and-so. This is part of the etiquette that is now standard, and the Prophet is utilizing it. Min Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Rasulullah, ila so-and-so. So he mentions who he is, he mentions who he is writing to. And each letter explains the message of Islam in five sentences, or sometimes four. Simple, to the point. Islam is one God, worship Him. It's very simple and to the point. Notice as well that each letter is catered to the one it is being written to. The letters are not all the same. So the letter that he writes to Najashi and to the Caesar has the verse of Ali Imran in it. But the letter that he wrote to Kisra did not have any verse in it. Because Kisra is not Ahli Kitab. And the verse in Ali Imran is about Ahli Kitab, right? And in Najashi's case, he explained to him what he believes about Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus to have been born of a virgin birth. and So he's explaining Christian theology to Najashi, that this is what we believe. So this is another interesting point as well. Also, one very important point for us here is that when the Prophet wrote his first letter to the Caesar, he was told, the emperors do not accept letters from other rulers unless the ruler himself stamps it and seals it with wax. So, you have to seal the letter with wax with your stamp and then the other ruler will open it so that it is very clear nobody has read it in the middle. Okay, so the process was told that this is the international diplomacy. These are the laws of writing letters to international in an international manner. What did he do? We all know what he did. He made a ring for himself and he ordered wax to be poured and then he put the wax on the, the he, he sealed the wax on the letter, right? And this is a very simple evidence to show there's nothing haram about imitating the norms of modern culture. There's nothing wrong with how others do business and we follow their norms. There's a few people that still, oh, we have our own. The Islamic culture, by and large, is not necessarily Islamic. Meaning, you're allowed to be broad-minded in this regard. Etiquettes, mannerisms, dialogue, cuisine, clothes, all of this is open. And therefore, when the Prophet heard, look, there is a new way, I have to do it in this manner, he actually did it in that manner. And notice as well, he addresses the people with their highest titles. From the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi to the Emperor of Rome, Ila Azim al Rome, to Kisra Azim, the, the Emperor of Persia. And he's giving them their honorary titles. And this is something, again, a part of the etiquettes. Also, uh, one of fiqh point to be derived here that from the letter to the people of Oman, it says in that letter that take jizya from the majus. And this clearly shows there is a controversy in the four madhahib. Two of the madhahib say that jizya can only be taken from Ahli Kitab. So in an ideal Islamic land, you can only have Ahli Kitab and Muslims. But the Hanafi madhab and most of the later Malikis, they say no, jizya can be taken from anybody. And of course the Hanafis definitely needed this rule because they ruled over Central Asia and they ruled over India and Central Asia and India had plenty of non-Ahli Kitab. right? And so they had need, definitely need, needed this rule. But the evidence is clearly shows that this position is the stronger one. Because the Prophet is writing to the people of Oman and Majus are not Ahli Kitab. Majus are not Ahli Kitab. And yet, Jizya is to be taken from them. So this clearly shows that it is open. Jizya can be taken in an, in an ideal Islamic state. Jizya can be taken from any uh, entity. Now, final point. Remember I said that the term Arisiyun or Arisiyin has brought a lot of discussion in classical uh, hadith uh, commentaries. And the reason being that Arisiyin is not an Arabic word. And if you look at any commentary of Bukhari, people are struggling. What did he mean by Arisiyun? Arisiyin? And most people say he must have meant the peasants and the masses. However, in our times or recently, Abu Hassan Nadwi, the famous scholar from India, Abu Hassan uh, Ali Nadwi, very famous scholar and Alim Rabbani, uh, he actually has a, an interesting opinion. And this opinion makes a lot of sense to me. He says, Arisiyun means the followers of Aris. 
And Aris is the Arabic of Arius. And Arius is a very, very famous, or I should say infamous, Christian theologian who died 336 CE. And Arius preached a very different version of Christianity than other uh, early Christian uh, theologians. And Arius preached a version that, I'm not going to say it is Islamic because it is different, but it is far closer to the Islamic notion of Jesus than other notions. For example, Arius believed there was a time when there was no Jesus Christ. There was only God. And Jesus then came into being later on. Clearly, that is not what mainstream Christians say, right? And the Arius uh, heresy became so widespread that when Constantine embraced Christianity, the first thing that they needed to do was to get rid of this Arius version of Christianity. So what did he do? Constantine, and this is very basic knowledge, all of us should be aware of this. Constantine called a international gathering of Christian bishops from around the Roman Empire. And they gathered together in the city of Nicaea. Not Nice. <laughs> nice. Nice is a different land. <laughs> Nicaea. Nice is in France. Nicaea is in, I think, modern Turkey. Nicaea. And, yeah, it is in modern Turkey. Nicaea is in modern Turkey. And in Nicaea, in the year 325, they debated for weeks on end, and they came forth with a creed. And the main point of the creed was refuting who? Arius. And the Arius heresy was made official. Anybody who believes in the doctrine of Arius is a heretic, meaning a murtad, he's a kafir. And he's not allowed to live here. So Arius was exiled and Arius fled down north. And, any, uh, and in, in the Nicene decree, it says anybody who has any books of Arius shall be burned at the stake and he'll be killed. So the writings of Arius have almost become non-existent and all of the information we have about him, we have from his enemies. And we don't know for sure exactly what he said, but clearly his teachings are much closer to Islam than any other version of Christianity, right? And the fact that the Prophet system is writing two and a half centuries later, referring to Christians as Arisiyun, right? The followers of Arius is very profound. It actually demonstrates that the Prophet system, it is as if he is saying, and, and by the way, I think this is the correct opinion, by the way. Because Arisiyun is not a term for peasants in the Arabic language. Arisiyun is not an Arab word. And our classical scholars had a lot of trouble. What is this word? What does it mean? And Arisiyun is exactly what you would call in Arabic the followers of Arius. Exactly what you would say. is Arisiyun is the followers of, of Arius. And, uh, and in fact, early, Christ, early Muslim books that write about Christian uh, heresiology, they mention uh, uh, Arisiyun, but they don't make the connection that that's what is mentioned in Bukhari. And one of the reasons that I think this is really the correct opinion is that if you look at the letter to Kisra, to Khusro, the Prophet ﷺ said, if you reject, then the sin of the Majus will be upon you. And this parallels exactly what is in Caesar's letter. Because if you understand Arisiyun to be peasants, then that doesn't match what he's written to Khusr. Are you guys following? Whereas if Arisiyun means Christians of a certain type, that would match what is being written to Khusr. And it is as if the Prophet is saying that, look, out of all of the groups of Christianity, now when the Prophet came, the Arius heresy had almost died out, but it's still alive. There are still people that follow Arius and there's small pockets. And it is as if the Prophet is saying that, look, the Arisiyun are the closest to Islam. And if they hear my message, and if you allow them to hear my message, they will embrace. But if you deny my message to them, then the group that will for sure convert, you will be responsible for them on Yom Al-Qiyamah. And this shows us that at a time when no Arab in Central Arabia would have possibly known of Arisiyun versus Monophysites versus Diophysites. Our Prophet is fully aware and he is writing about the Arisiyun. And just to give you an idea about how close Islam is to Arius and the belief of Arius, uh, Peter the Venerable, who was abbot of Cluny and who was one of the most famous Christians of the Crusades, Christian theologians of the Crusades. And Peter the Venerable is also the first Christian to ever translate the Quran into a Romance language, into Latin. The first person to ever uh, study Islam 
academically in order to refute it and to translate the Quran into Latin around 1250 or so. This is Peter the Venerable. So Peter the Venerable is a very famous person. All Christians who know medieval Christianity have heard of Peter the Venerable. And Peter the Venerable writes a refutation of Islam and in it he says that Muhammad وسلم, is the successor to Arius. It's amazing that when he studies Islam, Peter the Venerable says that our Prophet وسلم, he is nothing but a successor to Arius. So he sees in our theology echoes of Arius' theology. Right? And that, of course, is the Islamic position that Jesus is not divine or the Son of God, that Jesus was you know, created at a particular time and, then, uh, and he has all the honor that he has as a prophet and a human being. Now, Arius, well, he might not have been exactly like that, but no doubt he does not believe in the divinity of Jesus the way that the other Christian groups uh, believe in. And uh, that is a very interesting point. The final point, 10 seconds quickly. Uh, sorry to disappoint you, but... All of these pictures that you've seen of letters of the Prophet these are all not authentic. The actual letters of the Prophet have not lasted to our times. That's just not possible to have done. The writing material, they're written on parchments, they're written on leather, they would not last for 14 centuries. No document from that time has lasted on parchment. It's not going to. And there is, there are books that have, you know, Muslim books that have these pictures. These are all, you know, they're not real. Our process and our letters have been preserved in memory, in, 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 in the context, but not the actual physical letter that along with anything from the time of the process, neither his clothes, nor his shoes, nor his ring, nor anything, now, all that you see here and there, sorry to disappoint you, but no, it's not going to last for, you know, 14 centuries. These are things that are of a, uh, you know, cloth and whatnot. It's not going to last for that long. So these are not authentic. Uh, and with this, inshallah, we will stop for today. And next week, we'll talk about Umratul Qada and what happened when the Prophet uh, fulfilled his promise to go back to the Umrah. And, uh,